Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. I talk about SLS a great deal on this channel and I seldom have a lot of good things to say about it. And of course, recently, there certainly has to be, you know, an acknowledgement of what it's managed to accomplish. SLS performed fantastically on its maiden flight, sending Orion around the moon. Very few things went wrong with it, and hopefully this means that Artemis II will be happening again very soon. This is an immensely powerful rocket. Apparently, from what we've been able to see thus far, it seems to be pretty reliable, and that's because it's using a lot of reliable and well-understood technology, like the RS-25 engine, the solid rocket boosters from Morton Thiokol, or whatever they're called these days. But regardless, it appears that because of all of this well-established and well-understood technology, we have a rocket that seems to perform very well. However, is this really the way that it should have been done? Now, of course, I've talked a lot about how, you know, reusability should have been built into it, and this is a step backward. However, Falcon 9 didn't exist when SLS got going. Starship, of course, hadn't even been envisioned at the time. So way back when SLS was in its earlier design phases, it's understandable that they would have stuck to what we really understood the best, and that is just a big, expendable rocket. But then why did NASA go with the RS-25, a reusable engine, and so much shuttle technology, instead of going for the big, expendable rocket that we used to reach the moon in the first place? Why not simply recreate Saturn V? And why not use the legendary Saturn V F1 engines or some sort of duplicate of it? Well, guess what? NASA did indeed contract a liquid booster based on the F1. Actually, they were looking pretty much to reproduce the F1 in every respect, except to make it less expensive to produce and to make NASA capable of manufacturing it in bulk and instead of using so much hand-crafted work like they did in the first place. So what happened to this project, and what about these new engines, these new RS-25s, based on the engines that were so successful for the shuttle program? NASA keeps talking about how much better they are, what a big improvement they're going to be as we explore the moon. Are they any better, or are they just more expensive? RS-25 engines gimbling around, testing the ability to steer the rocket into space. They will operate at 109% performance, each RS-25 throwing down a half million pounds of thrust, all four, two million pounds, all together with the boosters, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. Yeah. And by the way, this is the latest episode in my 100K celebration. Thank you so much for getting me to this milestone. Sorry that I took a brief break from that. The reason for that is because I traveled to Huntsville and was covering everything going on at Dynetics. And then there were some incredibly important developments with Virgin Orbit that I wanted to cover as well. So now we're back to the celebration videos where I'm getting back to my roots, back to criticizing SL. SLS. As I said before, it's kind of tough to criticize this part of SLS because the RS-25 engines are so damn good. Indeed, the four engines that were used on this particular mission on Artemis 1, all of them had at least some components from the very first flight of Columbia back in 1981. And just as was the case with all of the previous shuttle launches, the RS-25s performed fantastically. 
The RS-25 runs off of hydrogen and oxygen, of course, and its reliability has really been unsurpassed. Nothing that SpaceX has produced up to this point has gone through so many reuses and is still functions so well. The RS-25 powered 135 flights of the space shuttle, 135 largely running off of the 12 remaining engines that are going to power Artemis II through four, and after that, we have to rely on new RS-25 engines being produced by Aerojet Rocketdyne, because sadly, each one of these engines is only going to be used one more time. We're not even going to have an RS-25 to put into a museum. NASA is going to use every one that remains. They can generate a peak performance of 512,000 pounds of thrust in vacuum, and also have a tremendous specific impulse. We're talking 452 seconds worth of specific impulse, and that's at 109% power. That is about 100 seconds longer than the Raptor engine from SpaceX. But at the same time, hydrogen and oxygen only produces so much thrust. You don't get quite as much bang for the buck. They are extremely efficient and have a very high specific impulse. But if you need a lot of power right at liftoff in order to fling a very heavy payload into orbit or all the way to the moon, well, you need with a little more initial kick, and that's where the solid rocket boosters come in. But as we all know, Saturn V didn't have solid rocket boosters. Instead, it only had five engines, five engines total to loft such a tremendous amount of payload all the way to the moon. How the hell was that possible? Well, because of the magic of F1, an engine that was in development for decades before we even flew to the moon, an engine that produced an insane amount of thrust. The F1 has often been described as a big, dumb engine. Well, it may have been dumb, but it was incredibly big and very, very powerful. We're talking 1.5 million pounds worth of thrust, triple the thrust of the RS-25. And largely that was because it was using oxygen and kerosene instead of oxygen and hydrogen. Oh yeah, and it was also way, way bigger than the RS-25. To put things into perspective. 10 F1 engines could generate the same amount of thrust as 33 Raptors on Starship. This thing was just miles beyond any other liquid engine that has ever been made. The Soviets couldn't reproduce it. They had to use huge numbers of engines on their N1 rocket as well. So why couldn't we make something like this again? Well, one of the reasons is price, and the other reason is we don't fully understand how to make them anymore. These things, as I said before, were in development for decades, and many of their components were handmade. They never really moved on to a mass production manufacturing environment for F1. So much of this engine was lovingly crafted by hand by people who are long dead. Each of these engines is 19 feet tall, and sorry for the shaky camera work, I took this while I was in Huntsville, and 12 feet wide, and they weigh over 9 tons, completely out of control, just massive, massive pieces of machinery. How could we possibly reproduce these today without hand making the components all over again and spending insane amounts of money? Well, 10 years ago, believe it or not, NASA was determined to try to reproduce the F-1 using modern manufacturing techniques including 3D printing, trying to reproduce the magic that NASA had over half a century ago and using it for SLS instead of the solid rocket boosters. And they gave this job to Dynetics, and I had an opportunity to learn a great deal about this during my visit there. It was part of NASA's SLS Advanced Advanced Booster Engineering Contest, a contest that strangely evaporated after NASA spent a considerable amount of money on it. But the whole idea was to put the F-1 
one into a new liquid booster and replace the solid rocket booster, still using the RS-25 as well, delivering a very large amount of thrust to the new SLS design. Each liquid booster would have two F1 engines, therefore delivering 3 million pounds of thrust apiece. If you paired this up with the RS-25 engines, you would get over 8 million pounds worth of thrust. But here's one of the advantages. Liquid boosters have a higher ISP than solid rocket boosters, which means they would have burned longer, delivering improved performance. This, by the way, was only one of a number of ideas that NASA had to replace place their existing SRBs, and then all of a sudden, they made the decision to just give the job back to Orbital ATK, formerly Morton Thiokol, and let them handle the SRBs. And in my opinion, this was an unfortunate decision, simply because it would have been nice to see at least some new technology being implemented with the SLS. Yeah, sure, they were F1 engines, just like Saturn V, so it's going back in time a bit, but at the same time, the improved performance would have allowed SLS to do more. Also, it is theoretically possible that these boosters could have been ejected and then recovered and possibly reused used if they could improve on the design, but even if they couldn't. Dynetics had come up with a variety of new 3D printing solutions to duplicate all of the amazing handcrafted work that had gone into F1, and by the way, that took a great deal of research, a great deal of time, and a great deal of money, and it's not like the project wasn't showing a great deal of promise. Let's hear a quote from the Dynetics team at the time. Quote, the Dynetics team identified a modernized F1 engine as the ideal advanced booster engine concept because of the Saturn Heritage engine 100% demonstrated flight reliability, high thrust, and simple low-pressure liquid oxygen and kerosene cycle. As a liquid engine, the F1 can be acceptance tested to screen for defects prior to integration and, with the vehicle restrained, can be run on the pad for pre-launch readiness demonstrations. Finally, if an engine does shut down. The booster can maintain vehicle control by shutting an engine down on the opposite booster, allowing either mission completion or a safe crew escape depending on the timing of the shutdown. And Dynetics also provided evaluations into initial load estimates using data from historical booster loads from the Space Shuttle program in order to estimate how much mass SLS could theoretically deliver if they use this kind of solution and the figures were impressive over 120 tons and that was with the most conservative estimates far more than SLS can deliver today but it was all for nothing. The contest was actually canceled. It's not like Orbital ATK was awarded the contract or won the contest or something. It was simply canceled and the solid rocket boosters were given back to Orbital ATK to complete the job. So there really was no competition at all for the rest of SLS's development. One of the many things that in my opinion really pushed up the cost and development time of this troubled rocket rocket system, but it gets even worse than that, because for all of the hype about the RS-25s, all of the supposed improvements, do you know how much of a performance improvement we have with the current RS-25s that are being designed for Artemis V and beyond? No improvement whatsoever. Let me say that again. No improvement whatsoever. The thrust isn't any better. The specific impulse isn't any better. Nothing about these engines are any better than the engines that push the space shuttle into orbit for over three decades. The only supposed improvements are the way that they're manufactured, supposedly using manufacturing techniques and 3D printing processes that are going to bring down the cost of the engines considerably. But if that is indeed the case, then why the hell is the contract so expensive? How expensive? $3.5 billion for 24 engines. Let me say that again. $3.5 billion for 24 engines. 
Now, this supposedly covers development cost and the labor to build and test the engines and produce tooling and support SLS flights powered by the engines. But nevertheless, when you break it down, we're talking over $145 million per engine or more than it costs to launch two Falcon 9s, two entire rockets, complete with 10 reusable Merlin engines, plus everything else it takes to get a rocket into space for the cost of a single RS-25 engine. How are we saving money here? How are we not spending insane amounts of money on a technology that we have been using for a very long period of time, but frankly is a huge step down because these engines will not be reused. All of the advantages that the RS-25 had in the past, that is to say it's incredible reliability, regardless of how many times you use these things, it doesn't matter because you're just gonna throw these things away. At the very least, Aerojet Rocketdyne should be exploring the possibility of something similar to smart reusability that ULA is doing right now. Utilizing an inflatable heat shield to eject and save these engines, allow them to re-enter the atmosphere, land in the ocean to be recovered, and possibly to be reused. Because doing things this way is costing far more money than it's worth, and really not giving SLS any improved performance whatsoever. So at long last, we come back to the biggest question. Why are things happening this way? Well, the answer, unfortunately, is pretty obvious. There's a reason why so many people call SLS the Senate launch system. By keeping things the way they've always been, by using the same manufacturers who built everything for the space shuttle and restarting all of their manufacturing plants and everything else associated with building shuttle technology, all of the jobs that used to exist in the states that are represented by politicians who always benefited from these jobs. In other words, by maintaining the status quo and not accepting any new innovation whatsoever, that's what allows these politicians and those they represent to flourish, and it marginalizes everybody else that could really bring something new and beneficial to the table. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. Also, please hit those notification bells so you get to see every video I put out, regardless of how unpopular it might be with the algorithm. And also, please consider supporting my channel. Everything is linked in the description. I'm going to be going to a space symposium in Colorado Springs here in the next couple of weeks. And of course, also, the orbital launch of Starship. So until then, guys, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.